much. Bye. A nine, nine and a half point victory, Iowa. Nine and a half point victory, Iowa, huh? I told you when we visited about this that these guys love you. So, do you like Kellyanne? <laughs> but what I know, it's been a whirlwind. The past year, 16 months, 18 months, you have been in the thick of it. So before we ask any other question, I want to know this. How are you? Oh, well, thank you, Bob. Thank you to Family Leader and the other co-sponsors and all of you, uh, not just for being here today and welcoming me, but also just for how committed you are engaged on the front lines of this ongoing battle. I'm great. I'm blessed. I feel incredibly honored and privileged to serve the country and to serve this president and vice president. Bob, it's, it's nothing short of a privilege. Um, I'm a good example, as are millions and millions of Americans, of reaching an American dream unexpectedly. I was raised by a single mom, um, and we were, you know, we had pictures of the Last Supper and Jesus on the wall, not Reagan or Kennedy, frankly. We, did, we just didn't. I don't remember a single political conversation ever in my household, which consisted of my mother her mother and two of my mother's unmarried sisters. So these four adult women raised me. And uh, to go from that to, to the White House as senior counselor to the president is, is pretty remarkable. But I, I want history to always reflect a couple of things. I get a lot of credit as the campaign manager, and that's a blessing in and of itself. But we had a really great team around us, and some of them are not household names, but all of them work together very cohesively and very smartly for us to get this done. I also think that there's just no substitute for great candidates who can connect naturally with people and who come as messengers with a very, a very optimistic and relevant message, uplifting message where people felt included and delivered in a way that, um, that took the, I think that Trump and Pence taking the message directly to the people coming to states like Iowa again and again and again was so critically important because rather than run a billion dollars worth of TV ads and talk to you through your living room rather than just look you in the eye uh, was very effective. See, I could not like to talk about myself. I got right back to the campaign. <laughs> but no, in terms of me, I feel very blessed. I mean, I have a, a great life, uh, four wonderful children, a husband, and uh, a, a job, an opportunity, I think, to impact real people. And I grew up, I would look at the folks at the rallies and they reminded me of the people I grew up with in South Jersey. And uh, this president made a commitment to them to be there for them. And I think you see the stock market has reacted. Job creation is up. Um, ISIS is on the run. He's had um, three foreign trips in less than two months, uh, another two dozen or more bilateral meetings at the White House. Progress is being made. And it's just our job every day to focus on the news and cut out the noise. And, and that's something I, I try to do um, very often. But you know, if I wasn't a person of faith, I think it'd be a more difficult job. Well, let me talk about family for just a second. Because my family and my former teachers are quite shocked that I'm actually making it in the real world, so to speak, okay? <laughs> uh, I don't know what would happen if they saw me walk. What does your family think that you're walking in the White House on a daily basis? Oh, they think it's great. They're, they, again, they... <laughs> I'm sure they do, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, for my children, I have four children. I'll say that uh, we're getting close to 100% of them enthusiastic that we've moved to Washington. You know, <laughs> when, you're, when you're a pollster, if you get 75% agreement on an issue, it's remarkable. But as a mother, you need closer to 100%. Yeah. So we're getting there. Uh, they, they think it's wonderful, and they realize, they think my four children, they're 12, 12, 9, and 7, Bob, so they are of the, each of them is of the, an age where they can appreciate and accept uh, the opportunities that they have to maybe come to the Easter egg roll or watch the fireworks on July 4th on Independence Day from the White House lawn, mm -hmm. and they realize that that helps, that that's the rarefied air that not everyone in this country has that type of privilege at the moment. I'm glad they see it that way. But look, if, if the lunch isn't packed correctly, if their permission slip isn't, isn't signed, if the sports equipment isn't cleaned and, and ready to go, then that falls on your shoulders. So it's very humbling in that way. I mean, I think I'm just better at everything I do because, the, look, the greatest professional privilege of my life will be working 
in the White House in this administration, but the, but the greatest privilege in my life by far is being mother to those four Amen. children. And Amen. that you know, will always come first. Amen. Twenty sixteen was a remarkable year, and it's not missed on anybody. But somebody was going to break through the glass ceiling. Oh. It was either going to be Hillary Clinton, the first female president, or what's not missed on me it was going to be the first female campaign manager to lead a winning presidential campaign. <laughs> so. First of all, congratulations. I've known you long enough. I've always respected your talent, your ability, uh, how articulate you are, and you've never, ever used a gender card. And you won't today either. But something's got to go through your head to say, I'm the first female to lead. What goes through your head knowing I'm the first? It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I, I, I've never, you, you, thank you for saying we don't play the gender card. Um, I really want history to reflect that I had been around for decades, you know, toiling in the vineyards. Three decades. Well, sort of, yes, many decades. <laughs> and no, 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 in work. And, and I had been in polling for decades. And I had been in polling, started at the age of 21, and went, then was a lawyer, and then went right back into polling. So I had been doing this for a long time, and I was successful and happy in my work. But it took Donald J. Trump to elevate me to that position. No one else had done that. And it's and I go by what people do, not by what they say, ultimately. And this is a man who's been, I think, a wonderful and gracious and generous boss to women his entire career. It was just a very natural thing for him to surround himself with strong women whose opinions he respects. And he did that in New York real estate in the 1970s and 80s when very few people did would take a chance on women at those high levels. He obviously is surrounded, he's got a wife and two adult daughters who are very intelligent and very strong. And he had done it at the Trump Corporation, the Trump campaign, the Trump cabinet, the Trump administration. It's very natural for him. But um, I do hope and I fully expect that we'll have a female president one day. I will tell your daughters and granddaughters that the job is still open uh, for first female president. I don't know that I would encourage any of my three daughters to do it, because I think in addition to having to have the fire in your belly, you have to swallow a lot of bile in your throat. And it's not, it's not the most comfortable and the most savory, I think, engagement or profession for many people, male or female. But um, clearly the country is ready for a female president, just not that one mm. at that time. <laughs> Have you been surprised? Because I see the left, I'm gonna use a generic term, but I see the left always wanting to champion women, 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 until a conservative woman achieves. And I know how some of them have treated you. Have you been surprised at some of the comments towards you? Well, I don't need accolades and gold stars, but I think we all deserve respect. Amen. And that's what's so surprising. And, and dis, I guess the word is disappointing. You're asking me, was I surprised? I'm, I tend to be an optimistic, um, sunny person, and I guess it's disappointing that if you can't say congratulations, then don't say anything at all. Mm. And look, I understand that we're a nation of charged opinions and partisan rancor, but I do find most of the, most of the vitriol comes from people who don't know me and who are very brave on social media. But I have good relationships, you know, which means they're not brave at all. Uh, I have great relationships with some of the female Democratic senators, for example, and members of Congress. Um, certainly, I have a lot of friends on the other side of the aisle. We respect each other, and we respect the fact that we live in a nation where we all, particularly women, can disagree. Mm. It's, it's enshrined in our laws, it's encouraged in our culture, and, and we do that respectfully. So I guess uh, I would worry for the country that all that noise and venom and rancor just seeps into our consciousness constantly. And I guess I'm surprised how easily it is to bait people if you want to. I just, uh, 
it, it's unbelievable how if, if I say something on a television program or if the president says something, the reaction has not, is so disconnected from what was just said. If you want to disagree on policy, if you disagree on tax reform or health care reform or immigration or you're for abortion and I'm not, uh, then say that. Disagree that way. That's what America is. But so, me, so much of the criticism of me is so gender-based. I saw some of it this morning. I would use it as examples, but this is a family audience. <laughs> um, but so much of it is gender-based, obviously. And I mean, uh, I, I remember, by the way, I'm old enough to remember when comedians were funny. I kind of miss those days. Yeah. And you know, for, for, um, you know, for them to, I'm not even going to say what they said because then it gives them a platform that they otherwise would not have. But I pray for the country and I pray for my critics. Again, if they're going to criticize policy, that's terrific. But criticizing, I mean, how I look or what I wear or how I speak, it's, it's, really, it's really remarkable. And it totally undercuts, you know, modern feminism saying that there are four women. I think a lot of it turned when I showed up at the March for Life and I was overtly a pro-life counselor to the president. A lot of the coverage changed then. But again, you know, we're a nation that if you believe in abortion for sex selective purposes, if you believe in abortion after a heartbeat is detected or after nonpartisan scientists say it, a baby can feel pain, if you believe in abortion in the eighth and ninth month, if you believe in taxpayer funded abortion, if you believe in abortion anytime, anyone, anywhere, we just had a candidate who believed all of that and she lost. And you're welcome to believe it, but I don't believe it. And that should be respected as well. Amen. Amen. This is a two part question is uh, I know your personal faith. You've talked about just recently in your, in your answers here. Can you give us insight into your faith journey and then why would a person of faith want to engage the institution of government? Yeah. Great questions. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm here all day. <laughs> I was raised Catholic uh, by a single mom and she, I think when my father left when I was very young, it worried her specifically. You know, she read all the statistics about uh, step five, you know, having a, being a, a, being raised by a single mom. Or, and I think for me, because we had so much faith in the household, and yes, I'm a proponent um, of, of course, of the family structure. But my family was unconventional. But I remember, you know, going to Catholic school my whole life, kindergarten through twelfth, and even college. That I remember coming home early in June of my second grade year, and I had just made First Holy Communion, and I, I was upset, and I'm not a big crier, but I was crying. And my one aunt said, why are you crying? And I said, we got this assignment to do, a tiny little piece of paper, we have an assignment to draw Father's Day, a Father's Day. Mm -hmm. and the only other kid in the class that didn't have a father, I think the father had passed away in one of the wars, probably Vietnam. Anyway, it was very rare where I grew up, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't have, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to draw, I don't know what to. And between the nun's guidance, you know, she wanted me to draw, she encouraged me to draw God the Father. So I did that on one side, and then the other side, my aunt said, well, you've got, and she mentioned all my uncles and um, godfathers and male figures in my life. She said, you better get busy, and she got me a big piece of oak tag. And mine ended up being the, the largest of all. And I feel like the combination of you know, growing up, feeling that there's something bigger than you, and being a person of faith, not feeling sorry for yourself, that you're different, recognizing that that's a strength, not a weakness, and also always believing that God has a plan and a way for each of us. Um, it's incorporated as part of my education. I don't talk that much about it. Uh, for any other reason other than I, one of my favorite gospels is talking about how if you're fasting or you're sacrificing, uh, make sure that you comb your hair and you uh, keep, wash your face. In other words, don't look like you're sacrificing. Don't look like you are in distress um, or 
were fasting. So I remember that as a way to be to try to be humble. And I think you know one of the things about this particular job and these blessings of the last year, Bob, is that with gravity and responsibility should come a certain degree of humility. And I'm very humbled by this moment in our nation's history, by the awesomeness of where I work, but I'm humbled in a way that I feel so many millions of Americans are counting on this president and vice president, and by extension, those of us who work closely with them, to get it right and to solve the problems or to start tackling them in a way that improves people's lives. Um, my portfolio includes, includes matters of faith. It also includes the opioid crisis. It includes, and, and even there, I feel like as a person of faith, we can't just work on interdiction and prevention, but treatment and recovery and to destigmatize what is becoming the scourge of our times, where no state has been spared and no demographic group has been untouched by opioid use and substance use disorder in a way where, um, because I am somebody who seeks and shows mercy and forgiveness and always believes that, that God shows mercy and forgiveness, that, or that, that that capacity would help me approach an issue like that is setting me feeling that I'm better than these people, feeling like I'm a peer of them, that they are my peers and they are my brothers and sisters. And if we can help somehow, that we should. Um, that's also answers to the second part of your question, which is why go in government? I mean, you should only go into public service if you literally think you can make a difference. Not figuratively, not as a slogan, but literally think it's the best place for you at that moment. It's nothing I saw or expected, but it's a blessing that's been put upon me. And I feel that if I, in my portfolio, if I'm working on, for example, health care reform, tax reform, um, also the opioid crisis, say military spouse employment, which of course would be a big issue here, and I've met with both of your senators on any number of these issues, for example, that you know, we want to make sure that the military spouses who are unemployed, underemployed, can connect their talent with opportunity in a way that's meaningful for them and their families. And you can do that through public service. Again, you can't do that. If I sat at the White House all day and read about myself, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> if I sit at the White House and I feel when President Trump said, the forgotten man or forgotten woman, he didn't mean forgotten in your communities, forgotten in your churches, or your synagogues. He meant forgotten by the swamp, the system, the special interest. And that's why we're there. And I think if you're a person of faith, it helps you to stay grounded and to remember why you're there. Um, I am incredibly moved by the many, to sew all this up in one, by the many, many people who approach me in person or write or email or text or call the White House switchboard and they get right through. Uh, just to say, and why not? It's your phone, it's your house. Uh, <laughs> and they just say, thank you so much. Thank you for inspiring. Thanks for being a role model to my daughters or granddaughters. Thanks for being there and sacrificing, because they know my family is sacrificed. I, look, I work for President Trump. I know half the country, or part of the country, may not have liked that. I wasn't expecting the election result, wasn't prepared for it. Um, but I don't think my seven-year-old daughter deserves to have all that slot put on her shoulders. So I appreciate, in fact, I know she doesn't. I appreciate the people who say, we know your, sa your family's sacrificing as well, and we pray for you. So all of that weave together really bolsters the soul and mm -hmm. allows you to realize that public service can be a great calling um, if the moment and the person and the duty all match up. And at the moment, they do. Everyone in this audience has their own faith journey. Now, they're not going to go back to the White House. You are. But how, I mean, I talked to Dr. Dobson the day after the election. And Dr. Dobson said this, he said, Bob, I don't think I've ever seen God's hand of intervention so obvious that I did that night of the election. How important was the faith vote in oh, 2016? It was essential. Um, President Trump, by some accounts, uh, won 80 to 16. I was just reading an old Washington Post article from the election. That's, I mean, that actually matches, if not exceeds, what President George W. Bush, or it approximates what he got in his re-election in 2004. So to be a, a non-incumbent uh, and get that kind of percentage, obviously did better than the candidates did in 2008 and 2012. 
And part of it was opponent, his opponent, but part of it was his message. I mean, for Donald Trump, who was a Manhattan male billionaire who for most of his life was pro-choice, to give the most impassioned defense of life I've ever heard from a presidential debate podium on October 19th in Las Vegas was nothing short of remarkable. He took what was two decades worth of research in the pro-life space and took the case right to Hillary Clinton and said, no, excuse me, you're extreme. You're extreme and here's why. And she really didn't have a good answer, to be frank with you. She did not have a good answer to that question. And um, for the president to have been so open get, going down to Liberty University um, and then also uh, sitting down with Pat Robertson, meeting with people's, people of faith, coming here to Iowa and speaking with family leader and others, Bob, but, um, and look what happened this week. I happened to be in the Oval Office when they, I happened to be there for a different meeting when the faith leaders came in. Some of them came in. They had been meeting, I think, with um, the vice president and others that day. They came in to take a picture. They laid hands on, on the president and prayed with him, and it was mocked. Mm. It was mocked. People had to mock it. Um, and I, I find that to be so unfortunate, but I hope for you, it has you deep in your faith, and you pray for those, you pray for the mockers. Uh, Amen. Amen. And so it's, it was important electorally, but I think more significantly, it remains important. People of faith should look at what's happened just in a few short months, Mexico City policy on day two or three of his presidency, and um, an executive order on funding Planned Parenthood as well. Uh, obviously, some of his moves on health care reform, tax reform, because I think that people of faith get stereotyped that they only care about one or two things, and we know you care about all of the above. I mean, reforming, repealing and replacing Obamacare in a way that helps the people who were left out of the system, and there are millions. Um, get, stabilizing these markets, giving confidence to these insurers that have left, including here in Iowa, and 19 of the 23 co-ops have failed. That's not just keeping a campaign promise. It's a moral imperative. It's a moral imperative to help those that we hear, the Obamacare victims, to come to the White House and tell us their stories to help them. So he is keeping faith with people of faith, and, um, and that extends to so many different issues. But, you know, I have to say thank you to those who came and battle on the front lines. It was a very rancorous election. And it's an, it, of course, he's for the Johnson Amendment as well and, and talks about that. He signed a religious liberty executive order, had a rose garden ceremony around that. So, and, and really, he's just getting started. So uh, the one thing I'll remind you about President Trump is on November 9th in those wee hours after he won, and, and yes, uh, the, pho the phone call came from Uba Abedin to my cell phone, and yes, Secretary Clinton congratulated and conceded the election. I heard it. Uh, and I said to Vice President-elect Pence, make sure you hear that on the phone. Here's the phone. <laughs> Have fun with the phone. But uh, yes, concede. I know some people are still not able to accept the election results. That would be nice. But anyhow, on that night, what did President Trump say? He went out there in his own words and said, I will be the president of all Americans, including those who did not support me. And I just hope that those who didn't support him can find their way to support him as their president as well. You've mentioned a couple of times um, where, where we all saw the picture where people were laying on hands, President Trump this past week, and then we saw it on some of the news channels where that was mocked. You talked about this being a charged environment. Social media people can be as brave as they think they can be and say something about any accountability or consequences. We, to be transparent and honest, we live in a divided nation. How do we bring healing and civility to this nation? Meaning, you can disagree with me all you want, but can we at least be agreeable while we disagree? Can we at least respect each other's right versus I have to hate? How do we bring civility and healing back to this nation? Well, we must. First, practice it, because seeing is the first step toward believing. Um, be the bigger person, which I think is exhausting sometimes, but <laughs> do it. Uh, I have to say, for me, I'm a lot like Donald Trump in that he always calls himself a counterpuncher. I really, throughout my life, have never tried to draw first blood. But, you know, when attacked, you can turn the other cheek, or you can also just some kind of put people in their place sometimes. Um, but. I think also focusing on policy and not politics. Politics is a means. 
It is the means, it is not the end, it is not the objective. Politics, you know, your, the ability to vote and participate in the electoral process, whether you're knocking on doors or making phone calls or writing a letter to the editor or attending forums, that's just a means. The end is the policy. And so if, if we can reorient this back to policy, because so much of the coverage is not, you know, as the person in the West Wing who does not say fake news, enemy of the people, opposition party, I don't say that. I could, um, but I don't, and I hope I won't. But some days I wonder. But but I do I do argue about I, my 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 beef is my grievance is not bias coverage is incomplete coverage. Bias coverage people can see for themselves. You can you can see that for yourselves when you want to see it. But it's incomplete coverage. It's that I think part of becoming civil is making sure people are connected with the relevant information that they need and they deserve. So if you haven't heard about yesterday's announcement, the largest crackdown in U.S. history between the DOJ and the HHS on Medicare fraud, um, Medicaid fraud, excuse me, uh, and o over-prescribing opioids where 400 physicians and nurses and pharmacists and practitioners were um, exposed $1.3 billion. I mean, it's a huge issue, but if you haven't heard that until I said it, it's because people aren't telling you the news. They're giving you the noise. If, you, if you're veterans or you know people are veterans and you don't know the four or five major measures that have happened in the last couple of weeks alone where you can access private care if you can't access it in a timely quality fashion through the VA, there's, a, there's an Accountability and Whistleblower Protection Act now. There's a 24-7 White House hotline for our veterans. If you don't know that, then you're not getting the no noise. news, you're getting the noise, and we're never going to be a civil society if it's all just attack, attack, attack. And look, folks, I know what the issue is. Well, facts right. matter, policy. Not politics, policy. Not personalities, principles. These time-honored guiding principles. And, and I think finding places of agreement. I have asked the Democrats, can we work together? I'm open. Give me a call. Hey, call me. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm open. Can we work together on opioid abuse? Can we work together on infrastructure? Is that really a partisan issue, the fact that our air traffic system was built when we had 100,000 passengers each year and we now have close to 1 billion? Is that really a partisan issue? Military spouse employment is partisan. You know, human rights are around the globe partisan. So we're open for business. Your mind and your heart are open for conversations. And I think one thing that you can do is to have a seven second, 70 second, and seven minute version for anybody who will listen of why you believe what you believe, why you are a conservative, or why you're a Christian conservative, or why you're, however you want to term it. Why? Why do you believe that? Because the fastest way to get more people on board or, or more people to show respect and then to listen with a, with a less clouded ear is by saying what you believe. Why? Because they'll look at you and they'll say, Bob, I like you, Thank and you. you're like me. They'll say, I like you, and you're like me. Our kids are in the same school. I see you in the community, in the places of worship. We live in the same area. We have friends in common. They'll say, you're like me. And that's the best way to, to truly expand the movement, expand um, the conversation. Because we, we do have to find it, but it's a two-way street, too. I mean, look, I was raised, I'm 50 years old, so I was raised at a time when you respect the office of the president and its current occupant, dead stop, unconditionally, end of story. And we don't see that. Mm. You don't see that everywhere. Uh, the, words, the words that are used to describe the office of the president and the vice president um, I, I, are, are really I think, unfortunate. And, and if we can show that, if we can join with the school systems to show that, if in our own communities we show that, I do think good, good things will come out of it. But in the meantime, I would, really, I would really ask those, and I see there are some in the room who I would ask them very politely to help us get the message out, to connect. If people are going to acknowledge their responsibility to, be, to, to tell you give people the facts and cover everything. At least acknowledge the role to connect individuals with information they need and that they deserve because good things are happening for people and I want to make sure that they have that information. I have faith in the wisdom of people. I, I know that they're going, to, they're going to see the job production, the regulatory rollback, the, the health care reform, the tax reform, the small business entrepreneurship, unleashing the energy investments. There's real excitement and 
I have to tell you, um, as somebody who doesn't like the gender card, I'm just super duper proud to be in a state where your first female governor is a Republican and the first female ever to represent Washington from Iowa is also a Republican. Yeah. That doesn't happen by accident. So yes, people will vote for women <laughs> if they, not because they share their gender, but because they share their vision and they share their position on issues and they share their values. That's yes. what's important. Well said. I think what you just summed up then is civility. And we talk about that a lot. Find common ground with somebody, because we, we do share common ground, and then put principle over politics. And I think you summed that up very well. When you and I talked earlier last week or whenever it was, and you said, well, how much time do I have on stage? And I told you how much time you had on stage. You said, well, great. That's like me clearing my throat. <laughs> and uh, One day I'll be paid by the word. I can't wait. <laughs> I do have a final question, though, for you. Uh-oh. Uh no, there's no oaths here. I tell you, there'd be no gotcha questions. Is the final question I have is how can this audience, how can we as the family leader pray for you, pray for the president, pray for this White House, pray for this country? You also see, I mean, the president was just, you know, he's been traveling a lot internationally. How do we pray for this world? I mean, what would you say this is what I, this is what we need prayer for right now? Well, thank you for covering us in prayer. And the us is all of us who work in this administration, the president, the vice president, their families. But really pray for a nation. Pray for a nation to be more humble, more grateful, more positive, more prosperous, more safe, um, and more, I would say, more fearful of, fearful of God mm. and, and less suspicious of each other. That's what I would say. I think that we misplace our suspicions and we misplace our fears and we misplace our anger. Um, it's a dangerous world. There are many people who don't like this country just because we give girls and women rights, just because we believe that we're, you know, we're based on principles of freedom and democracy and inalienable rights given by God, and that we pra our laws protect equality and we practice fairness. So. Pray, pray for the protection of our nation and pray for more peace and understanding. But recognize, too, that at the same time, we will disagree. And that's part of the health of a nation at this, at this point in time. But pray that the disagreement remains civil. Um, you know, the gentleman who shot Congressman Scalise, who is still laying in a hospital bed a month later, he didn't hate baseball or sunny days in June. He hated Republicans. Mm -hmm. And he had been on social media. You know, nobody wants to talk about it much anymore, but we should think about that. He and he is to blame for what he did. But we should think about how hot mm -hmm. the rhetoric gets sometimes and how free people are with the adjectives and the descriptions and the hate. What is all this hate? I think take a deep breath and encourage other people to get some fresh air. What is everybody doing on the, on the, on the computer all day anyway? Get some fresh air. Look up, look up get, once in a while. Get a job. Get, tra get dressed and get some fresh air once in a while. So thank you for your prayers and your love for the, really for, for me and my family, but truly for the president, the vice president, their wives, their families, and most importantly, this great nation. Now, I'm glad you brought fear of God. When, when I visited President Trump, then Donald Trump, the last time I had after he was the presumptive nominee in his office, I won't talk about the entire conversation, but one of the things we talked about was the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. And I'm glad you brought that up. We're not going to have everybody come up and lay hands on you because there's secret service and we don't want to have anything happen. But I'd like to have you stand. I'm going to pray for Kellyanne right now, and then uh, we're going to thank her for showing up in Iowa. Dear Lord, we just thank you. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to live in a land that is free a land that recognizes that our rights come from God, not from government and not from any person. Lord, we pray that uh, we would humble ourselves, that we would go to our knees, and that, that we would look towards, towards you, that we would constantly be in prayers. The scripture says that we be pray, that we pray without ceasing. Lord, that we truly would seek your face, look through your eyes, be your hands, be your feet. We pray for this administration, President Trump, Vice President Pence, Kellyanne, the entire team around, Lord. We pray that they would seek you as they look to lead 
the greatest country in the world. And Lord, we pray that we would turn from anything that separates us from you and that we'd give it all up to you and we lay it all down at the foot of the cross. And Lord, then we're going to claim your word that you will hear our prayer. You will forgive our sin and you'll heal this land and bring a revival in our time, an unprecedented revival from coast to coast where we are restored to that beacon in the night, that shining city on a hill. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly and